Let us pray. We thank you, God of love, for the world this morning, for blue skies and warm sun, greening grass and budding flowers, for baptisms, and for children getting ready for school, and for this time together. God, be present to us. Silence in us any voice but yours, and speak the word you have for us today, the word we need. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, hi, I'm Kyle, and I am a people pleaser. Okay, it's probably more accurate to say that I'm actually a recovering people pleaser. It turns out that many of us pastor types and those in the helping professions are people pleasers. Maybe you are too. Some studies say that some 80% of pastors are people pleasers. We want people to like us. We want approval. And seeking approval can be a potent addiction, can't it? And so I am struck by Paul's question in his letter to the Galatians, Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? And then his answer to himself, if I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Psychology Central defines people pleasing this way. People pleasers yearn, yearn for outside validation. Their personal feeling of security and self-confidence is based on getting approval of others, from others. They worry about how others will view them. They, they fear that they'll be disliked or rejected by a person or a group, whether it's friends or family or coworkers. People-pleasers' happiness is based on other people's perception of them. One list describes uh, the 21 struggles all people-pleasers know to be true. See if you can see yourself among them. When asked to give a dollar to a charity at the grocery store checkout, you're either going to give a dollar or feel really, really bad for not doing it. You know the way to the airport by heart because you've given so many people rides there. You've helped everyone move, literally everyone. Even if you don't want to do anything over the weekend, you're still triple booked for each day. In some ways, our culture is built around this principle of people-pleasing and of seeking approval. After all, that's what the advertising industry is all about. We try to make our employers happy. We try to make our kids happy. We seek our parents' approval or our spouse's approval. When we post something on Facebook, we count up, up the, the number of likes that we get. The beauty industry is based on this principle. Women have, who have straight hair want it curly, and those who have curly hair want to straighten it. And if we could just lose that last 10 pounds, people would surely like us more. Whose approval do you seek? I have had grown men and women in my office in my pastoral counseling practice, tied up in knots because they were seeking their parents' approval of them, of who they really are, approval that never, ever comes. Whose approval do you seek? Sometimes we seek 
the approval that we think will come if we just get a bigger house or a better car or a fatter bank account. I recently heard this story about an American business, businessman who took a quick vacation to a coastal village in Mexico. He went down to the pier to buy some fresh fish and a small boat pulled up to the pier. Inside the boat there, were, there was a weathered fisherman and several large fin tuna. The businessman complimented the man on the quality of his fish and he asked how long it took him to catch them. And the man said, well, just a little while. And the businessman asked why he didn't stay out there longer to catch more fish. I have enough to support my family's needs, the fisherman said. What do you do with the rest of your time, the businessman asked. The fisherman said, I sleep late. I fish a little. I play with my children. I take siestas with my wife, Maria. I write a little poetry. I stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play the guitar with my friends. I have a very full and busy life. You should spend more time fishing, the businessman said. You would make more money and you could buy a bigger boat. And with the profit from the fish, you could fit in a bigger boat. You would, could buy several boats. Eventually, you'd have a fleet of boats, and you would even open your own cannery. Then you would leave this little village, and you'd move to Mexico City, where you would make more connections and expand your enterprise. The fisherman said, how long would that take? He calculated, well, you could do it in about 15 or 20 years. And then what, asked the fisherman. Well, that's the best part. When the time is right, you'll announce an IPO, and you'll sell your company stock, and you'd be rich. You'd make millions. Millions, said the fisherman, then what? Well, then you would retire and move to a small coastal village where you could sleep late and fish a little, play with your grandchildren, take siestas with your wife, Write some poetry and then stroll into the village in the evenings where you sip wine and play the guitar with your friends. Whose approval do you seek? Don't get me wrong. Making people happy is a good thing, a worthy thing. I believe it got, gives God pleasure when we love one another, when we give of ourselves, but seeking another's approval above seeking God's can also be a dangerous thing. People pleasing and pleasing God are not always mutually exclusive, but we know that that old adage is true. It's impossible to please all the people all the time. And acting out of the fear of another's disapproval when you believe that you have God's approval is not what God wants for us. The truth is, other people's praise, other people's approval should not be our ultimate goal. Paul said, if we were still pleasing people, then we would not be a servant of Christ. It's God's approval that we seek. Paul is reminding us of the bankruptcy of being chained to seeking approval of people rather than God. He's reminding us that there's a freedom that comes from getting off the hamster wheel of seeking approval of people and of always coming up short of expectations. And it's also the freedom of the gospel, freedom from putting our own self-worth in other people's hands but also putting it in God's capable and loving hands. But let's be careful here. Too many of us have this conception of a God uh, that you need to do good works for, and if you do enough right things, God will like you. 
and be happy with you or do good things for you. They think of a God who has a big ledger book. So they work and they work and they work and they try to please God to get God's approval. And they wonder what they have done wrong when they hit a bump in the road of their lives. And they've just traded one hamster wheel for another. But that's not how God works at all, I don't think. Yes, God wants us to be our best selves. But we should try to please God, not so that God will be good and loving to us, not because God is keeping some ledger book of our transgressions. No, we try to please God precisely because God is so good and loving to us. We try to be just to one another because God is dealing justly with us. Sometimes, often, seeking God's approval rather than other people's is the hardest thing we can do. Paul found that out the hard way, and of course Jesus did too. When we seek God's approval instead of the world's, we risk alienating our friends sometimes, or our family, or the culture around us. Those who risked their lives to save Jewish people during the Holocaust risked everything to do the right thing. Those who stood up against racism in the Jim Crow South did too. Many are risking today to do the right thing. A pastor friend of mine wrote in her blog this week that some say our nation is on the cusp of another civil war, fomented on lies and demonization of those whose political thoughts or values differ from our own. She said a time might come, and surely will, when we will have the opportunity to do the easy thing, to seek others' approval, or to do the right thing, that which God approves. We are faced with important choices. Who we want to be, how we want to be, and whom we want to follow. To whom will we belong? I love the story this week about the Little League game down south. Maybe some of you saw it. It's about two boys on opposing teams in the regional championship. When they woke up that morning, They only cared about one thing, making it to Williamsport, which is where the World Little League Championship Tournament is. And then in that first inning, everything changed. One team had scored three runs in the top of the first, but the other came right back in the bottom of the inning, scoring two runs. And they had a rally going on, and then the star pitcher, Caden Shelton, in a twist of fate, lost control of his fastball and hit the batter, Isaiah Jarvis, right in the helmet, causing him to fall into a heap at home plate. Suddenly, no one was thinking about Williamsport anymore. Coaches and medical staff rushed to him, and and the umpire exclaimed, oh my God. And the players took a knee. And finally the batter, Jarvis, got up and he trotted down to first, and, and now the trouble, the trouble was with the pitcher, Shelton. Before that pitch, he had only one thought, to win the battle, to please his coaches, to make his parents proud. Now the only words he could hear in his head were the words of the umpire, oh my God. And just like that, he started to cry. He was standing on the mound crying and nobody went to him. Not his teammates, not his coaches. I think we have a slide. But one person did go to him. Isaiah Jarvis. He left first base, he threw off his helmet, and he walked right up to the pitcher who had just hit him 
and he hugged him. That hug said, it's okay. It was just what Shelton needed. The game resumed, somebody won, somebody lost. One team went to Williamsport, the other packed their bags for home. It will all be forgotten, except for that one special moment. And I think God approved. You see, God knows us inside and out. Psalm 139 says, there is nowhere you can hide from God. God knows the good, the bad, and the ugly about us, but about you and me. But there's, here's the good news. There is no sin, no brokenness, no ugliness, no mistake, no transgression that will prevent God's approving of you and me. The truth is you and I are beloved children of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. We are not perfect, but we are beloved nonetheless. Today we baptized little Everly Joy, and we acknowledge that God has claimed her as his own. And we rest in the confidence that she will always have God's approval, if occasionally not her parents' approval. We know that God's grace and love will be her life's companion. So friends, as we go through this week ahead, let us remember Paul's words every day and ask them, that, ask those same questions of ourselves. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Friends, let us choose to be servants of Christ. Amen.